Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to give a short update on cleaning validation in the personal care industry or cosmetic industry. So we are getting very often in touch with our customers and they say, yes, we have validated the process or we have done cleaning validation. And we identified that, yeah, for each of the company, it is meaning a little bit a different story. And what we want to do today is we want to, yeah, first of all, look a little bit into the regulations influencing the personal care market so the cosmetic industry um, marcel will then talk about the cosmos standard and ecocert and these kind of considerations what have to be done in the um, cosmetic industry and then we will finally see a life cycle approach what is let's say like a risk-based uh, cleaning validation approach as we would see it as a state of the art today and um, what we want to do is we want to give you an overview of different regulations and of different possibilities to use uh, cleaning validation guidelines for your own processes on site. So saying that, I would like to start to review a little bit some of the uh, yeah, cleaning validation guidelines. So the regulations, and we said here influencing the personal care, um, because what we have seen is that in the kind of cleaning validation, a lot of companies are going into the direction of pharma. So we will make some connections to the cosmetic GMP. We will also see um, that there is a pharma regulation on that describes validation in a more detailed way and even give you uh, some other uh, guidance documents. So I said, we will look to the cosmetic GMP. So the ISO 22716. Um, we will look also what the FDA is outlining because they are demanding for over-the-counter drugs um, that you do a cleaning validation, also even for personal care products. So if you produce a dandruff shampoo, uh, then there is the need to do a kind of cleaning validation as well. Um, we also need to look at the international featured standards for household and personal care products, because also here we can find very good hints of what a state of the art at the moment uh, to do a cleaning validation and what elements should be included. And you will see that these elements are a little bit more vague compared to the ones we find, for example, for the pharmaceutical industry. So in the pharmaceutical industry, we have, for example, the Annex 15 or some ASTM guidance coming uh, also from the US. And here we want to make now step by step a short review on what is in cleaning validation defined in different regulations. And these slides are a little bit text heavy, but we want to just emphasize um, the main points and want to give it to you as a reference because you maybe want to read a little bit more in detail. And this is why we have here a little bit of word by word um, yeah, presentation, but we will not read out all the slides. So for cleaning validation definition, for example, if we start with the personal care, uh, so the cosmetic GMP, uh, it will just outline that you should ensure a level of cleanliness and appearance to eliminate generally visible dirt from a surface. And this is how people, some people run the cleaning validation. They say, hmm, I will do a kind of cleaning. And if I get a clean surface afterwards, if it's visually clean, and I do this one, two, three or more times after each other, I will call it then after a time validated. The international featured standard is then also outlining that you should do a hazard analysis and an assessment of the associated risk, what is to cleaning and disinfection, so that you have a schedule in place and implement it on your site. So this goes a little bit more into the detail to say you should think of the risk you have during the cleaning or is your next product influenced by the previous product if you don't clean it properly, these kind of considerations. If we move to the left-hand side here, to the pharmaceutical side, then they outline clearly, this is the confirmation of the effectiveness of a cleaning procedure for the product contact surfaces, very important. So here we are talking about product contact surface touching directly the uh, product, and that should be a documented evidence. This is a 
golden rule in pharmaceutical manufacturing, what is not documented, what is not written. This is why there is always a lot of documentation needed. And uh, that is sometimes even true also for over-the-counter products, what you want to maybe bring into the US market. So the ASTM guide outlines that there should be a scientific evidence that a cleaning process is capable on delivering clean equipment. So these kind of definition of cleaning validation are existing and it goes from documentation just to the level of cleanliness what you want to ensure. So this is the the spend width, I would say. So the, the minimum or maximum point you can use for your validation, what you will want to set up for your site. If we talk about a cleaning agent, also here we can start um, on the right hand side, an appropriate cleaning and sanitization program should be existing for all equipments. This is what the cosmetic GMP tells you. And even the international featured standard tells you the documented cleaning procedure should be in place for all the equipment. So here it is outlined that this is a kind of documentation that the cleaning agent is fixed also in the personal care section. In Annex 15, of course, the pharmaceutical world is looking to determine the variable factors what influences the cleaning, and we will come to these variable factors on the second half of the presentation, or in the second, uh, in the third, third part of the presentation, let's say it like that, um, and that you get even a re reliable and consistent cleaning yes. and process performance. So the FDA tells you the equipment and utensils shall be cleaned, maintained and sanitized at appropriate intervals and even more that they want to have a kind of, yeah, let's say composition known of the detergent. This is also what the PIC-S is telling us so that the cleaning agent composition should be known. PIC-S is the Pharmaceutical Inspection Convention Scheme. So the come together of the inspection parties uh, from a lot of different countries. Um, also, what the cosmetic GMP tells us for cleaning agents is that this cleaning and sanitizing agent should be specified and effective. So the specification, so to say, this is the detergent I will use for this process. This is an absolute requirement also for the cosmetic GMP. To know the composition of a cleaning agent and its variability uh, is a subject for our pharmaceutical customers and they would require to even have with each of the um, deliveries a certificate of analysis, for example, to define that this is the proper cleaning agent. But normally if you define it in the cosmetic area, that's already a very good step into the right validation. If we talk about worst cases, because maybe you want to do a kind of grouping strategy, easy to clean, medium to clean, hard to clean, these kind of things, um, then it's outlined even in the cosmetic GMP that cleaning and sanitization agents yeah, have to be specified and effective. So they should be effective for maybe your worst cases. This is why it can happen that you have another detergent for hard to clean products or even an additive to a standard product or maybe even just a higher concentration of your standard product um, for these kind of worst cases. In the pharmaceutical world, they of course tell us then that the worst case approach is looking to scientific rationals um, to select the worst case. And this can be solubility, cleanability, toxicity, and potency. As the cosmetic products are normally having no potency or not very uh, high toxicity uh, rates. Um, we very often go for the cleanability and sometimes even also look if there are insoluble materials like pigments inside, what needs a specific cleaning. Also from the point of the acceptance limits. So how do I clean it down, down to what level? We get a good understanding here uh, in the cosmetic GMP when we say the equipment should be cleaned and if necessary sanitized at appropriate intervals. So that also means that we have a kind of thinking, when do we want to clean during a campaign or is that only at the end of the campaign, these kind of things and down to what level. The international featured standard then says you should define acceptable levels that cleaning uh, should get, go to. That could be the visual appearance. So meaning after cleaning, 
the visual acceptance criteria is there to show you yeah visual clean is what is required and maybe uh, also a kind of microbiology on a surface so atp measurements bioluminescence techniques could be used to identify if you have cleaned down to a proper level in pharma you would do a carryover limit calculation based on health based exposure limits we also have this kind of information for personal care products to calculate the limits, but it's very seldom that they are used at this kind of uh, stage at the moment. You can even also go to acceptance limits based on fixed limits, for example, the 10 ppm criteria, what is mentioned by the FDA and also by the um, PICS. Then if we have set a limit, we also want to analyze on it. And uh, the analytical methods for testing are also described that they should be validated for pharmaceutical applications. But for personal care, this is not 100% the case, but we would strongly recommend also to go to validated test methods or even good established test methods like total organic carbon measurement or having a proper HPLC method um, identified for the detergent or even for the kind of product residues what you want to look at. So more, all over the um, different industries, like even if you're an OTC producer, if you're going into the pharma section or if you just pu purely manufacture cosmetic products, um, we see that there are different levels of validation done. And maybe you can find yourself somewhere in these approaches. So the risk analysis just with an hazard analysis of critical control points is done for a lot of um, the personal care customers, what we see today. The number of replicates are often done with the three default uh, runs. So that means after three successful runs, you would consider a process already as validated. And the analytical acceptance criteria are very often looking into the equipment of visual cleanliness, maybe have a kind of conductivity or TOC measurement for the validation, but then for the ongoing uh, yeah, monitoring of the process, just the conductivity is used. And the cleaning validation here is verifying that visual clean is achieved and that the detergent residues are out and the microbiology is also under control. So if we go up to the level of pharmaceutical validation, it requires a little bit more. Maybe you want to look for specific analytical methods for active pharmaceutical ingredients or even active ingredients in the uh, OTC production. Um, but more than that, you have even different considerations on the worst case approach and even the um, risk-based determination of the number of replicates. So if you run 300 batches a year of a product to have then only three runs for validation is maybe a little bit too little in the uh, pharma world. They would require to say, maybe you will do a re-verification every 10 batches or something like that, just to make sure that your process is still under control and is running well. So with that, I would like to hand it over to Marcel to tell us a little bit more what the COSMOS standard and the EcoCert um, is requiring. But first of all, I want to remember you, please, if you have a question and you want to yeah, say, get more information on certain topics, you can use the chat function already now in, in English language or even in Italian. It can both be handled um, in the question and answer session at the end of, of this presentation. But now I hand over to Marcel to tell us a little bit more about the COSMOS standards. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> like all of you in, in the market, we are working also uh, according to uh, uh, the COSMOS standards to, uh, to develop cleaning uh, detergents that comply to that standard. And, but what are the requirements that we need uh, for that? In the technical guide, uh, section 9.2, there uh, the cleaning products uh, used at any stage of the process of COSMOS certified ingredients have to fulfill those requirements. So in that technical section, you can read what, what requirements there are for detergents to clean your products that are produced according to the COSMOS standards. Um, so what detergents are allowed? 
in, in basis, uh, it's more or less the same as you. Uh, in one slide back, please, Thomas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's the same like you. Yeah, the, we are working with plant-based uh, cleaning products. And um, um, Cosmos is, is having that. Uh, so um, you can also use uh, other certified bodies like EcoCert or IKEA. So if they comply to that standard, Cosmos will also approve that cleaning agents for a Cosmos uh, approved product. If you have problems, you can always go to the Techno Committee for an assessment. If we look into the disinfection, uh, it's quite uh, quite narrow. So they specify uh, uh, three type of products that you could use for disinfection. One topic that I will discuss later in the, in the latest chart is that uh, the has some differences between uh, Cosmos and EcoCert uh, on, on looking to what's allowed before and after the cleaning. If we look to the EcoCert standard, a uh, little bit different in the, um, in the approach, but in the end, it's, it's looking to the same. Uh, we have to specify uh, uh, according to other substances, substances. So uh, everything has to be organic. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, products that are used for cleaning in, in uh, conventional products to clean, uh, hard to clean uh, residues of uh, cosmetic industry like EDTA, uh, for minerals or chlorinated products for perfumes or even phosphonates and surfactants that are not allowed. So it's, it's looking to get the, the good products in the, the portfolio of the organic uh, substances to create a, a well-performing uh, product. There are some, but we have challenges. So if we look at the multi-purpose facility, uh, what's the cleaning in practice? So you have to clean before an organic reduction and there the focus is really on cross the contamination. So you do not want to have conventional products into your organic uh, product. If we look after the organic production, then it's really looking uh, to the focus of the sustainability factors. So using less water, less energy and uh, having those uh, surfactants, uh, for, especially surfactants that are environmental friendly. One difference is in, in EcoCert and Cosmos approach is that EcoCert really specifies there has to be both, but Cosmos is saying more, okay, if you look at the sustainability factors, if we are got a very hard to clean product, then you can even use a conventional product. Looking into the de disinfection step, uh, it has to be uh, on, on, on the validation, on the, on the approved methods. So EcoCert uh, approved uh, products are still there. So we got our conventional Oxonia Active, for instance, or uh, hot water that you can use. So um, there is not really a big uh, differences in, in conventional disinfection and, uh, and EcoCert Cosmos disinfection. But one thing you can remember if you're doing hot water sanitization, is that sustainable? So if you go, for instance, to a, a chemical disinfection with, uh, with a product like uh, Oxonia Active, you can use cold water and even use less water. So uh, looking into that, you got a lot of possibilities to support uh, EcoCert or Cosmos uh, approved products. So that was my part of the story. Um, I hand over to Thomas to talk about the life cycle approach to cleaning validation and the three stages that are in. Thank, Thank you, you very much, you Marcel. Yeah. I just uh, outlined here um, that I, I learned also something new. I was really, uh, yeah, looking into the Cosmos standard and uh, that we can use EcoCert approved product also for Cosmos. I think that is already a very good sign so that we can, um, yeah, use the kind of existing product registration also for a wider uh, yeah, Cosmos even standard. Thank you for that. And I would now like to, to look a little bit more into the life cycle approach of, an, of a cleaning validation. Because in the past, we were always talking about a cleaning validation is a, is a one of, I would say, a project. So that we start 
uh, with a project and uh, at a certain point of time, it was called, now this is validated and I will not touch it. And we know specifically in the personal care cosmetic area, there are so many new products that this can really not um, yeah, be said. So we have a lot of um, our cosmetic colleagues where, uh, who are outlining 20, 30% of the product portfolio is renewed every year. There are new raw materials coming in. And this is also then a problem to bring this into the validated state as, as well. So this is why we want to, yeah, I would say argue more or less for a life cycle approach in cleaning validation. Meaning in the first stage, there is the design and development of the cleaning um, process itself and also of the documentation to use the scientific rationals to support um, the cleaning process development. And if you do that in a good way, you have also the possibility to say afterwards, oh, the product I have now new or the raw material I get new on site uh, is fitting into a certain category. I, I stay with the simple example of easy to clean, medium to clean, hard to clean. If you have a good definition already in the design and development phase, what is hard to clean? Maybe formulations with high melting uh, waxes because you need it in the production. Then there is already an idea of if you make new formulas in the same range um, that they fall under the hard to clean residues and so on. So going on with the qualification, so to demonstrate that the cleaning process is effective and then the monitoring process to ensure that also over the time, the cleaning process is delivering you the best cleaning result. So with that, we need a little bit of documentation, yeah, a kind of validation policy to describe what we are thinking from the, from the company perspective, what is in scope of the validation, what should be out of scope, so that we have a clear understanding of what cleaning validation means for my company. And I think this is a very important point here because this can be different for different um, yeah, industries, even producing different products. So this kind of validation policy is then giving us the possibility to show in what category our products fall and how serious or how deep we look into the cleaning validation. With that, you will set up a validation master plan uh, to include here SOPs, training records, and even cleaning records to make a kind of protocol happening. And then we will write some We'll get some technical reports to facilitate our decisions and also make the cleaning validation protocol so that at the summary we can outline afterwards, my process now is a validated process in the terms of cleaning and I exactly know how to handle it. And if there is something new, I will also be able to make kind of adjustments or even outline that this kind of information is required to make the decision, is it easy to clean, medium to clean, hard to clean, for example. So the documentation scope and uh, in, in these slides, what are coming up now, uh, we will more focus on the left-hand side, giving you the, the keywords, let's say, and on the right-hand side, there are a few regulations where, for example, here is an exception outlined, but uh, Overall, that should be then on the right hand side be again for you as a reference and uh, we want to really make a kind of validation documentation review that we say yeah you get a, an overview of what guidelines you want to use. You have set your objective and scope for your site and you even define the roles and responsibilities in the beginning of the cleaning validation project. Then you will do a kind of risk assessment of what is the carryover meaning for me? Do I need to calculate maximum allowable carryovers or will I just have like a 10 ppm criteria? These kind of things and you will create product group families or equipment grouping if you have a lot of the same equipment might want only to validate one because the others are very, very similar. So these are the, the required documents and during the development process, you can 
identify um, what are the designs of the equipment. So are they really the same, even if they have different dimensions? Uh, is the cleaning uh, done in the same way so that the cleaning process is always the same? What are the cl critical cleaning factors? These will be coming out of the cleaning process development data. So a cleaning process design will be done normally based on some laboratory trials. And then here you can identify, oh, tea cleaning temperature is very important or um, the cleaning time. I need to circulate minimum for 30 minutes. Then uh, you know what is your critical factor for cleaning, what drives your cleaning activity. And then to make a kind of uh, yeah, selection of the SOP. So how to write it and even sometimes cleaning agents selection, what we just heard, do we need an EcoCert product or is Cosmos our focus or do we really need a pharmaceutical cleaner because we want to make PDE calculations, all these kind of things. So what kind of cleaning agent is really for my um, application the best one and the most suitable? Uh, you can also imagine a GMP product, even if it's a GMP product and you want to use a CIP cleaner for manual cleaning, that will not work very fine because cleaning in place products, high alkaline um, products, for example, cannot be used for manual application. So the operator can come in contact with the solution. So this is what we have to avoid. So then we know already for the manual cleaning, we are doing a different selection for cleaning agents compared to the um, cleaning in place or soaking. So if you fill up a tank up to the top and you stir it for a certain amount of time, that is also a cleaning procedure we see often. But there you can even use also other chemistries than the classical manual cleaning because no operator will come in contact with this cleaning solution in the equipment in the homogenizer or in the in the storage tank or whatever and uh, in manual cleaning you will ha have the direct contact so these kind of design thinkings are there and also what we look often into is the materials of construction so that we have a possibility to outline what are sensitive materials we have to take care of that we don't destroy them for example, aluminum, if this is a part of your production, or if it's just stainless steel, you are in a good way. But what ceilings are you, uh, are in use? These kind of questions are coming up. Um, what kind of surface finish do you have? Is there a design of the equipment to be cleanable, automatic? So do you have some dead legs somewhere? Is a cleaning in place or cleaning out of place scenario? So do you have to dismantle things to make a kind of cleaning or can you do it as you make the product and even then if you have done the cleaning also the inspection is very important can i make a visual clean inspection to all the inner surface of the pro of the equipment touching the product and if this is true then that could be also a good reason to say and i will use visual inspection as the go-to point for my validation studies so the cleaning process design is, of course, then to understand the manufacturing process, meaning what is the dirty hold time of a product? So how long will the equipment stand dirty before I can start a cleaning because of a shift change or because of a yeah, public holiday and you are not working or yeah, there could be several reasons. And is these kind of dirty hold time then at an ambient temperature or is the product maybe heated during the filling and this is why there is a heat treatment on the surface for a certain amount of time. So these kind of identification needs to be done to say what is the kind of residue I need to remove. And even what we want to identify very often are these critical control points for cleaning. As I said, is the cleaning more important to have the right concentration of the detergent or is it more important to get down to a certain or to get up to a certain temperature for cleaning or is the mechanical action important so that I have to track the flow to the spray balls. So these kind of critical process points are really needed to understand. And then if I understand these ones, I can also make my kind of validation much more useful to the practical world to say, yeah, I need this kind of 80 degrees temperature for my um, 
I let just say a uh, lipstick to remove it like these everlasting lipsticks needs a high temperature and if I'm do not get to that temperature, I cannot clean it. That is a critical control point and it should be added to your validation documentation that you require this temperature for a certain amount of time. We should also look at the cleaning design in case of worst case residues. So I would maybe not call it salts because these are product residues in your equipment. And if you have this kind of worst case already identified, very good. Uh, we will also be able to assist you with laboratory studies to see what is harder to remove compared to other products you do on, on your site. The definition, how clean is clean or how clean is clean enough should also be made during the cleaning process design, meaning is it a 10 ppm criteria or is it like a limit setting maximum allowable will carry over. So just to remind the cleaning process, of course, always requires some time, some mechanical action, some chemistry and some temperature. And for validation, you should identify what is driving my cleaning. Is it the long cleaning time or is it more the temperature? Is it more the chemistry? Do I have to make sure that I dose the chemistry in a correct way up to a good percentage? And even if we have considered all of that, then we also look into different conditions. Like, do I have different water qualities on site? Is purified water better for cleaning compared to tap water or the other way around? That could be an environmental consideration to say, I will clean with tap water because it's much cheaper and the environmental fr more friendly. Because to produce purified water, you have to use energy and you have to use tap water for that. And so you will not get by all out, all out, all as purified water, what you put in as tap water. So these kind of considerations is what we are doing. Also looking to the nature of the residues or the surfaces being cleaned, also the materials of construction, we had it before. And then we want to see how we do the success criteria. Is it just a visual inspection? Will you track detergent residues by conductivity? Are product residues tracked? Maybe if you have a specific API, active pharmaceutical ingredient, or even the yeah, kind of molecule what is uh, yeah, seen as an active, uh, will you track these residues? And what is about the microbiological uh, residues on, the, on your surface? So these kind of considerations is what we want to make and we want to bring to your attention. So the cleaning agent selection, we had it already before. The chemistry is one important part of the cleaning. It's sometimes not the most important one, but there should be some considerations behind. So what chemistry is allowed, we got a good example of Marcel, what should not be allowed, for example, for Cosmos or for EcoCert approaches, then you would not have the possibility to use these kind of chemistries in the cleaning. And even the question, is your cleaning agent compatible with the equipment you have on hand? And what about the detergent stability? If you heat it up for, for very high temperature, is it still doing the cleaning? There are also available some cleaning products. What are degrading over the time? Do I have to yeah, redose cleaning agent after a while? This is specifically true for some of the additives, um, what are containing some active ingredients. So these kind of considerations should be done when you do a cleaning agent selection. If you have identified a cleaning agent and you maybe want to get to a product family, so grouping your products on site into different families or groups. So as I said, very often I find easy to clean, medium to clean, hard to clean. Uh, then is this clear for you what belongs to what group? So is a hair care, a body lotion, a body cleaner, is that all easy to clean? Or do you have maybe some body cleaners what have some, um, yeah, I would say critical materials inside. So gabapol gel, or maybe um, there are some opacifiers used what are very hard to clean afterwards. So then these kind of yeah, examples can tell us, do you identify your easy to clean products in a right way and what belongs to that group and what is your medium or what is your hard to clean? Is it the pigmented powders or sunscreens or whatever? So these kind of 
thinking is what you have to do and you should maybe have even some rational to make this decision. So to look at your formulations and to define key ingredients and titanium dioxide level, what is maybe above 5% could be hard to clean. Below that, it's maybe easy to clean for you. So then you have a decision also, if you get new products on site to outline, oh yeah, this is belonging more to medium to clean because there is titanium dioxide in, but below 5%. These kind of things is what we want to give you on the way to make a kind of homework to be ready to make an easier decision in the future if you get new products on site. If you have a lot of the, uh, equipment what is similar to each other, you can also group them together, for example, on the equipment type. So is this the filling lines? Will they all be cleaned in the same way, like a manual cleaning? Or is these a process equipment, homogenizers, what will be cleaned in a way, and they are all made maybe from the same manufacturer? Uh, these kind of situations is what we see on site. Also, the um, cleaning method can be a way of grouping things together. A classical example would be if you put small parts into a parts washer. Here you will have always the same cleaning method. You press the number of the cleaning you would require, cleaning method one for an easy to clean product, and it will apply always like that. So that would be a good description of how a cleaning method can be a part of a grouping strategy. You should always have the rationale and the justification for what is the worst case equipment also for you, meaning where are the most angles to see crevices or a lot of maybe polymer materials are involved because you have to connect a lot of hoses to an equipment and this, these are hard to clean. So these kind of questions can also help you to make the justification on yeah, if I want to go for the worst case equipment for my cleaning validation studies, how can I do that? I will look to all the details and then I can make a decision from a scientific point of view. This is the worst case equipment for me because it contains this and this materials or it is very hard to clean as there are a lot of different geometries inside of the equipment. And with that, we are at the cleaning process design and development. This is what we often do in our laboratory, just to give you an idea, uh, in our lab, in, in our R&D here in uh, Monheim, Germany, we get around 400 different products every year on our desks to make cleaning process development studies. So you can see here uh, in the middle of the slide a few coupons, what are with residues before, and then we clean them, and we will make a decision if there are the cleaning process is effective or more effective with another product. And even that will be then following up with a scale up in a small um, production skid. We have like a four. It have also on site. So we want to optimize and fine tune your cleaning cycles also related to the um, environmental and sustainability approach. And just to give you an idea, um, we see a lot of cleaning processes what are installed since years in uh, companies. And they have never been asked why is the specific water quality used or a specific temperature used or a specific detergent used. And if we are going on sites, very often we identify cleaning savings. So savings in cleaning by 20 to 30 percent of process time reduction or even on cost and chemistry reduction because they were very conservative in laying out the cleaning of this equipment. But at the end of the day, what you really need would be a little bit different from what you are doing today. So you are doing maybe even a little bit more of what is required for an effective cleaning today. And this is what you can identify if you want to talk about sustainability and even the validation will show you the kind of process is still running as you have designed it. We will then even look into a system based on the fact that we want to sample some locations. Sometimes it's even easy to reach every inside of the equipment. This is what I've outlined before then, the decision to make visual inspection as the go-to point 
is really there, but maybe there are some materials of construction what have a problem in visual inspection where you have to go very close to and to see that. So this kind of decision is then to make, is this an area you want to focus on or is the contribution to the overall surface area of this so small, so maybe less than 5% of the overall surface in the equipment that you will just yeah, forget about it. If you do a kind of analysis, we said visual inspection is always done. If you're in a higher risk area, you might want to do conductivity checks or total organic carbon analysis of the rinse water, for example. And if you are really getting into trouble or you want to know if an active is out of the system, then you might go for HPLC even for specific ingredients in your, de in your product or in the detergent. For the documentation, we already had that before, what kind of information should be in the cleaning process, design and development. So going from the scope and objective up to the analytical sampling, um, to the report at the end of the day that everything was done in order and is now cleaned and sanitized. If you then go to qualify, your equipment, you will demonstrate that the cleaning process is effective. You clean down to your allowable carryover and it can be 10 ppm, it can be a calculated permitted daily exposure value or health-based exposure limit or whatever. And you would have to document that in your protocol. So very often we see visual inspection is the one go-to go point as a standard. Maybe you add some photos of how does it look like even today. Then the product residue limits on a default level, 10 ppm is used very often, or a thousandth part of the smallest therapeutic dose if you are running with products having a therapeutic dose. Even cleaning agent residue limits are calculated using the PDE concept, permitted daily exposure, or even the 10 ppm default limit. Also, you should make up your mind on the microbiological limits. And at the end of the day, if you have some acceptance criteria, you want to check for it, you will make a decision if you want to use a swab sample, a rinse sample, what is this acceptable for you? Do you have to use a combination? Uh, what will you do for ongoing monitoring? Is it only rinse sampling? Maybe the rinse of the um, final, do final rinse uh, water, for example. Yeah, this can be done. And if we think that we have installed a good acceptance criteria and we have a good uh, reading in our equipment, then it's also good to make an, a statement that, yeah, we, we have a kind of process under control. And we know even if we are sampling, for example, with swaps, we have considered recovery factors. How good can I swap a surface and get the um, extracted residue from the surface into my analytical method so that I can find the 10 ppm. And if I only find 8 ppm, then I have 8 80% as a recovery factor. And that is what I calculate in with the acceptance criteria calculation. So from our point of view, then the documentation is even going more into the documentation of how long is the cleaning hold time? How long is the dirty hold time? What kind of uh, campaign is running before the cleaning starts? What is the worst case in that case? And I will also demonstrate during the stage two what sampling locations will I use to identify my acceptance criteria. And I will also describe how do I do a deviation management. If I find something strange, if there is a deviation, do I have to redo everything? Do I just re-clean something? So this is what we will identify during the stage two. At the end, we will get a summary report of the stage two, and it will then conclude that this kind of qualification is done. So the performance qualification has been done and we are sure that we can, yeah, analyze down to a good level. If we have done that, we will then go to a continued um, verification process. That means we have understood our critical control points. Is the temperature important? Is the cleaning time? Is the concentration important? And we are tracking that by 
conductivity or by run times of pumps or by pressure indication or whatever. And we will track that and even make data analysis if we can see trends. So if an if a process always is running at two bars at the spray balls, and then I see suddenly, oh, there is five bars on the spray balls, maybe there is a blockage somewhere, and then the cleaning might be more ineffective. But we have to identify that there is a difference. So this is why it's always good to have like a window in between of 50 and 55 degrees the cleaning should be. And then you can have a look, oh yeah, it is in this window, or is it outside? The monitoring can be inline or even offline when you take samples and go with it to the laboratory. Depending on your level of risk, maybe multiple analyzers are required or just one analysis is needed. And we would also then emphasize to use the cleaning logbooks to identify that everything runs in order. If there is a cleaning failure, of course, you have to do a root, root cause analysis to find out what has happened and why was it not in your expected result. And this can lead then to the continuous process improvement, meaning you have the control under of your process, you know exactly how it should run. And if you see, for example, you're running 10 minutes of rinsing after cleaning the equipment, and after two minutes, you already identify, oh, there is the water conductivity reached. So why do I continuously rinse eight hours, uh, eight minutes more the equipment and spend the water, give it down to drain when I even know there is no change in the process anymore. And this is what I mean that the continuous verification or the step three can really help us if we look for sustainability, for example, that we can identify there is no, no real change to the cleaning process itself, but it just gives you a possibility of savings. So with that, we are coming to the end of the presentation and there is just to be mentioned that if you do some maintenance of the equipment, you might also look to things like repassivation of stainless steel, or you want to look at historical data after making a maintenance. So to say, if you are back on track, so if your performance is on the same level as it was before the maintenance. And you would also make like a, a risk-based approach to identify what has to be done at the maintenance level. So if your temperature is very important, you might want to do a maintenance on the temperature sensor more often, for example, than on the conductivity control of the rinse water because it is maybe not so yeah, sensitive for your process. So also what kind of critical components are identified and needs to be monitored, like sealing materials uh, can be mentioned here, should be part of your maintenance process. You should also do a periodic review of your cleaning programs. So to look at the cleaning records, if there were some corrective actions or preventive actions done and closed, why is that done and how does that affect your process now and even that is good for operator training to even include swabbing and visual inspection every year maybe to have always state of the art and good practice in taking samples and making the visual inspection because that is also very often discussed. So here we are now at the end of the presentation and I hope you got a little bit of the difference of the regulations influencing the cosmetic industry. So starting with the cosmetic GMP requirements, going up to the level of pharmaceutical validation, as well as seeing what kind of yeah, things we need for to come comply with the COSMOS standard and to have EcoCert products, what are even already approved now that are, that are also applicable for COSMOS cleaning today. And that a life cycle approach in cleaning validation can really help you at the end of the day to make quicker decisions on is the cleaning process stable and can I do some kind of monitoring that helps me to identify is there a saving what I can get from the sustainability point of view, maybe from the production process time point of view that I'm in control all the time with my process, but I have the possibility to yeah, tweak a little bit on the process.